Hey friends, tickets are now available for our new series of live workshops taking place in November and December. They're focused on getting coffee professionals and small business owners better prepared for 2023. There's one for coffee professionals, one for those looking to start or grow their business as a coffee consultant, and there's one for customer acquisition planning that's tailored to small business owners. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash events to grab tickets or check the show notes for details. Welcome back to the Daily Coffee Pro, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and we are joined by Abby Munoz from Monarch Coffee. This is our second in a five-part series. And Abby, we are talking about Hawaiian coffee being a closed-loop system. So in today's episode, I want to talk about like what the Hawaiian coffee as an origin, like it as we said in the last episode, it's quite the unique setup. And in our conversations uh, between you and I, I'm I'm often saying to you, like, you know that that's not how it normally is in other origins <laughs> a lot of the time. And you're like, no, I don't. <laughs> We're kind of insulated here. <laughs> so give us kind of in this episode the landscape of, like, how the, the origin of Hawaii, sorry, how – Hawaii as a coffee origin is sort of set up and what's unique about it? Yeah, so we uh, handle all aspects of the production from from harvest. It never leaves my farm, our farms. I mean, there are some producers who are picking their cherry and selling their cherry to um, a larger producer. Um, But for us, we pick it. We have a mill right on the farm. We process it um, that night. Um, Do whatever magic we're going to do or not magic. (laughs) Um, I mean, there's no magic to it, right? It's just best practices every time. You know, I just, I really feel so strongly about um, come and see what we do. We love, like, I would love, we love for people to come and, kind of follow us around and, and uh, share the journey um, because there's nothing really secretive or proprietary. It's just that at every step of the process, we're making the best choices and protecting that fruit the best way that we can. Mm. Um, so we process it. Um, we dry it. We have an amazing um uh, it's a greenhouse, like this huge, like greenhouse uh, that has fans and automatic cooler shade situations uh, on our. We dry on raised uh, beds out in the dry deck, and um, then it goes in these really nice storage rooms that are climate controlled, and and then when it's time, it all gets hold and and milled and packaged and either gets sent off to one of our roaster partners um, on the mainland or um, we roast it right there on the farm and bag it and send it on its way. So are are you going to be selling your coffee? Do you sell your coffee internationally? We just are starting. We, we, well, not just starting early in the beginning. Um, before I kind of came on board and our leadership kind of started to grow. Um, we were in Taiwan. We sold coffee to Taiwan and Japan. Mm-hmm. So some Asian countries, um, but us and Canada. Um, but aside from that, and so now we're just exploring how we, you know, who do I, how does, what does that look like? Right. To go right. into Australia, Saudi Arabia, some other, you know, what other kind of countries are looking for Hawaiian coffees? And what makes Hawaiian coffees different from, because you grow, you grow geshas, you grow pakamaras. What else do you guys grow? It, it we flows just, to that's gesha it. and pakamara, yeah. right? Yeah. Are there other varietals on the island? Yeah, there's uh, mochas, um, SL20, like SL28, Guatemalan Tipica, which we now call uh, Kona Tipica because it's been here for so long. 
Um, you know, everybody's kind of experimenting with lots of different varietals. We're working on, um, the Hawaii Coffee Association is working on um, partnering with um, CTAR and University of Hawaii to come up with, to work with some rust resistant varietals to be able to bring in, I think Obata and something else as part of the conversation. And um, so we have a good response team that's working to, to find what those right varietals mm. are for our growing region. Um, but like gashas from Hawaii tend to have more fruit forward note. Like to me, I feel like they're fruitier than the Panama geishas, but the Panama geishas have way more florality. Wow. Right. So the florality in Panama geishas, um, like specifically La Esmeralda Hacienda, let's say. Um, and that's where seed stock came from. But the coffees that I tasted specifically from there have way more florality than like intense. The intensity is higher, right? Where the florality in our gesha tends to be a little bit more delicate. Is that as a result of the terroir or of because of the processing? I think it's a terroir. Okay. Right? Like, uh, I mean, um, I'm not certain on what they're processing, you know, like just a typical washed gesha that we have on our farm compared to, you know, I'm comparing mm. apples to apples. Um, I feel like also um, a lot of, you know, in Panama and other growing regions, like they're doing a lot of sun-dried naturals mm -hmm. and naturals are really hard, kind of tricky to do here. Oh. Um, because like, we don't get this super intense heat. Like we get a lot of humidity harvest is for us on our farm and every part of the Island is kind of different, but for us, harvest runs from like, we really want it to start in September, but you know, mother nature has her <laughs> own plan. <laughs> Hashtag climate change. <laughs> 100%. We were so tracking our <laughs> harvest to start because the way the flowering happened, we thought, okay, our harvest is going to start in September. And like the end of July, I had like Pacamara just popping off the trees like crazy. Wow. And all of our Pacamara fruit like hit really hard uh, end of July, August and September. And by mid October, we were really, and I think a lot of that had to do with the coffee leaf rest. We were really seeing our yield kind of slow down. Our fruit wasn't ripening as quickly. And so, or it was turning really fast. And so we made a couple of decisions to kind of pull that harvest a little sooner than we probably would have pushed it out. But our Gesha harvest um, started in I mean, we were picking some red fruit in September, but really our peak came the end of October, just a couple of weeks ago. So we've had mm. two really good rounds. Um, and so I, and so our harvest will go until probably the end of January. Our hurricane season is that. <laughs> it's something you don't right eat very into, often. <laughs> right. Into, <laughs> Right goes like all, so all of August and September on October is hurricane season. So the humidity is really high. You know, we sit right at like 86 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe at the highest, hottest part of the day up there in the drying, in the greenhouse drying deck we have, um, it gets, we work really diligently to keep that temperature like just under a hundred degrees to kind of keep that parchment safe and secure. But um our nights we cool down at night like, like what would it get low to six, like low to the low 60s uh, so for the celsius so for the celsius folks the... sorry i'll tell you uh so in the 80s it's we're looking at like you know mid 20s celsius and in the 90s we're looking at 30s uh so 100 would be like you're looking at good mid 30s which is yeah but that's hot but in the sixties, we're looking at like in the in the late teens, yeah. uh, Celsius. But just day so after, know. yeah. So day after day of humidity, it makes it really different difficult for us to get a handle on moisture content and and moisture activity. That is mm -hmm. our biggest obstacle. 
don't really. So sun-dried naturals, I generally need to wait until later in the harvest, which is better for the, right? Because we have way better, riper, delicious, the sugar content of that fruit is incredible. Um, but um, it makes it a little bit challenging to process that way. So yeah, wow. I find that when I first, when we first started coffee farming, most farmers were just pretty much doing washed coffees here in Hawaii. And most of the larger producers are doing that. Um, and not really messing with multiple, you know, lots and processing methods. Yeah. Wow. In the next episode, it tastes gonna... so good. <laughs> God damn it does. I know it. <laughs> it tastes so good. Like that Pacamara. And that's where the difference I think lies. Like with the Pacamara, like it, it, processed like a whole fruit and we're just I, I mean like we call it whole fruit I know it totally messes with everybody when I talk like that but <laughs> sun-dried natural you could just call it a natural for coffee <laughs> like for, for purposes of transparency um <laughs> is that <laughs> I call it whatever it is it's whole fruit you pick it off of the tree <laughs> Right when it when the pakamar isn't done like that, you lose that really red ripe plum, like yeah. those really intense berry complexity fruit notes. So it just tends to, and then it ends up being more um, like a lot of lime, stone fruit kind of flavors, and so that's the difference. <laughs> So, you know, that was just a, a whole thing like, folks, if you want to go and try this coffee, monarchcoffee.com. Like, <laughs> after you, the enthusiasm, it tastes so damn good. It's like, <laughs> everyone head to monarchcoffee.com. <laughs> it was beautiful and passionate. I love it. I do love hearing producers talk about their own coffee because they've got access that those of us who brew coffee don't have you know you get to and this is why I'm so fascinated by the Hawaiian closed loop system because you guys are producing it and processing it roasting it and then selling it so the people who buy it off you get to have conversations with you of what it was like on the tree and that's why I think it's so fantastic that you guys get tourists that come in. They can take a tour of the farm and then they can taste coffee that was grown on the soil that they just stepped on. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. They are tasting like the the absolute, like the the complete life that that coffee has lived, yeah. right? Yeah. It, they are tasting um, the volcanic soil. They are tasting our climate. Um, they're tasting... Um, they're getting to experience and uh, all of, all of the hands, like, like, like it's in the cup, right? It takes yeah. so many yeah. hands to make that cup of coffee and they're getting like up close and personal about that. It's like getting a backstage pass to yeah, your favorite to, uh, gig rock star. It's t- <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. So let's move on from that comment really quickly. So <laughs> um, let's in the next episode, we're going to talk about the things that surprise you along the way, because we're in some very okay. interesting times right now. Um, and I suspect we're in for a lot of surprises, particularly for producers around the world. Um, so let's talk about that in the next episode. Perfect. Okay. Peace, love and peanut butter, everybody. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in, friends. There are two ways you can support this podcast. Firstly, become a paid member of our YouTube channel. Secondly, you can join our Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video before you leave and check the show notes for more information. Now, this is what you should check out next.